Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Garrity. I'm a registered dietitian um, in the outpatient setting at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about caring for the ambulatory patient who has a uh, G-tube, J-tube, and how to manage them, and essentially what the importance is uh, of the dietitian in managing these patients. As we know, they're very nutritionally high-risk patients. Um, so essentially the dietitian, right, we are the ones that are assessing the patient's nutrition needs, calories, protein, fluid needs, right, and allowing the team, the, their medical team, to know exactly what it is that the patient needs. As we're aware, many doctors and nurses, as fabulous as they are, aren't necessarily completely aware of the nutritional needs of the patient, how we calculate these. And so that's why it's important as the dietitian to be actively involved, especially before the patient has their feeding tube placed, right? So as the dietitian, um, one of the most important things is to make sure that you are speaking with the patient prior to tube placement. Working in the outpatient field, especially because I work primarily with the head and neck population, Many of them end up getting feeding tubes for obvious reasons, usually severe adenophagia, dysphagia, right? And so essentially before they get their feeding tube placed, I wanna make sure that I have an initial consultation with them, not only to review what the feeding tube is going to be like, right? But I also wanna get a really good understanding of how they've been eating over the last several weeks. One reason why that's really important is refeeding risk syndrome, right? Um, we're, we're essentially not sure, right, what, what the, um, how frequent refeeding risk or refeeding syndrome happens, but we want to make sure we're doing a full assessment of the patient. What we do at Sloan Kettering is we use the Aspen criteria to um, formalize whether or not we think the patient should be a direct admission before their tube is placed or at the time of admission. What's very different from managing a patient on the outside of the hospital versus the inside is that when a patient is admitted, they can have their labs, especially their phosphorus, magnesium, and potassium very closely monitored. So we know if the patient is at risk for refeeding syndrome. The issue on the outpatient side, right, is that the patient is typically not having their labs drawn very frequently. Maybe it's once before the tube is placed, but certainly not for the week following, right? And if the patient is at high risk, we wanna make sure that they are admitted at the time of tube placement, right? So that they can be monitored very closely and that we can administer and start their feeds at a very conservative rate. Essentially, if I think that a patient is at high risk for refeeding syndrome, what I will do is contact their primary care team and let them know that I've done a full nutrition assessment and that I've deemed that the patient is at high risk for refeeding syndrome. Fortunately, what happens after that, whether or not the patient admit, is admitted or not, is typically up to the primary care team or the, the, the primary physician who is um, referring this patient for a feeding tube placement. Um, I would say most often the team is um, on board with your recommendations, but there are times that the team may say, you know what? I don't think we're going to directly admit this patient. We'll just closely monitor them, in which case it's really, really imperative that you speak with the patient about very conservative advancement of their enteral feedings and make sure you communicate with the team what your recommendations are for slow advancements, right? So maybe you're only administering a carton a day of formula initially, and then you slowly work that up to an additional carton over the course of a week to get them to goal rate, to ensure that they are tolerating, right? That's gonna be really important. The other thing that's really important in this initial assessment before the patient has their tube placed is to talk to them about what they might expect. What method of administration are you recommending? Is a patient going to have a J-tube? So unfortunately, they're going to have to have a pump, right? They're gonna be pump fed. If they're having a G-tube placed, are you going to recommend bolus? Are you going to recommend gravity feeds, right? You have to take into account the patient's lifestyle. So if the patient is this active patient, they like to go out and hike or they still work full time and they're traveling around, you wanna make sure you're recommending a feeding regimen that will work for their lifestyle. Many patients end up having a feeding tube placed while they're inpatient. They end up being discharged on a regimen that is maybe appropriate while they're admitted because they're in bed all day, but not so appropriate on the outside once they're home and trying to have, you know, get their lives back together and, and you know, um, carry out their, their normal activities. So it's really important that you talk to them about what would work best for them. 
I also like to go over the types of formulas, right? Would you want something that's fiber containing? Would you want, does the patient need something that's, you know, consistent carbohydrate based? These are all things you want to discuss with the patient and really be very open about what you're recommending and why. Another thing that's really important to discuss with the patient, especially if they're not eating anything by mouth, is the importance of adequate hydration and free water flushes. So frequently, the patients don't really understand the importance of free water flushes, adequate flushing, not only for the purpose of maintaining tube patency, right, so it doesn't clog, especially with medication administration, but we want to make sure that the patient is staying adequately hydrated. Too often, patients are put on a concentrated formula. They're flushing the minimum, maybe 30 mLs, you know, a few, you know, every few hours, and they do become significantly underhydrated in which case your, your sort of reactionary recommendations come into place. You really want to make sure you're reviewing those the importance of free water and giving them specifics. You know, yes, your fluid needs for the day are 2,000 milliliters or 1,800 milliliters. And if you're getting gravity feeds or bolus feeds, this is how many times a day you need to be flushing. Write it out. At Sloan Kettering, we actually have a booklet where we write out specifics, right? Um, and, and then we end up sending it to the patient so they have everything in written form, okay? Now, once you do your initial assessment and the patient is going for their two placement, right? Maybe it's maybe they are gonna be admitted because they're at risk for refeeding. Maybe it's done in the outpatient or ambulatory setting. Either way, the next step is to get the team involved so we can get the patient set up for enteral supplies, um, including formula and equipment. How do we do that? Well, on staff, and I would imagine most institutions do, we have case management. Case management are the ones that um, uh, essentially manage getting the patient set up with a DME vendor. A DME vendor is a durable medical equipment vendor. They are the ones that typically supply things like oxygen, wheelchairs, um, but they also supply, a lot of them supply enteral formula um, or enteral nutrition supplies, right? What's really, really important when it comes to getting the patient covered with their insurance is to make sure that your documentation is consistent with the documentation of the doctor, the nurse, speech pathology. The reason why clinical documentation is often necessary and needs to be sent to the vendor for insurance approval. These insurance companies need to see that the patient needs the formula, the supplies, right? They cannot maintain adequate nutrition by mouth alone. So if you're the dietitian and you say the patient needs the formula, they need the feeding tube, you know, to meet greater than 75% of their needs. And then the doctor's note says the patient's eating great. You know, he's doing wonderful. You really want to make sure that your documentation aligns. I've had circumstances where, the speech pathologist, myself, the doctor, we've all had to kind of convene and say, hey, I think we need to make our documentation uh, more consistent with one another, which is easy enough to do. You just want to make sure you're doing that because, again, your documentation does matter. Another thing that's really, really important, especially if the pa patient has Medicaid or Medicare, you want to make sure that you are documenting that the patient is going to need the enteral feeding for at least 90 days. They want to make sure that the tube feeding, the supplemental nutrition is going to be needed for at least 90 days or more to be covered, right? Another thing that's really tricky that I learned the hard way is that the patient needs to, uh, the, the formula or the enteral feedings need to be providing at least 75% or more of their estimated nutrition needs in order to be covered by insurance. If the patient is able to eat more than 25% of their nutrition needs by mouth, Medicaid or Medicare may not cover the formula and the supplies. So you really want to make sure you're documenting that as well. Actually, in our enteral, in our clinical notes, we now have a, a section that talks about um, what percentage of calories and protein the enteral nutrition formula will be providing. So we have clear documentation and it won't be an issue. I do want to mention, however, there are certain, certain circumstances and certain insurances where they will actually not cover the formula or the supplies. Some private insurance companies think of enteral formula as a grocery item, as food. So if we have to buy our groceries, then you should be able to buy your own groceries, which can be a real problem. As we know, formula is very expensive, enteral, enteral supplies and equipment like syringes, 
pumps, gravity bags, it really adds up, especially when patients require these things long term. So um, one thing I often recommend to patients, which is incredibly helpful, and if you haven't heard of it, it's the OLE Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization specifically for two-fed patients. The OLE Foundation not only is an incredible resource um, for enterally fed patients, um, but they also have a donation page where anyone who's had a tube feed and perhaps they have extra supplies or they no longer have their feed and they have all this extra equipment, they can actually list what supplies, what formula they have that are up for donation. And so patients can go on there and find formula, pumps, syringes, bags um, on the Oli Foundation, and they can contact uh, that person directly. Many patients often tell me after they finally have their feeding tube removed, I have cases and cases of formula. I don't know what to do with it. Will the DME vendor take it back or can I donate it to my local hospital? Unfortunately, no. Um, I wish that were the case, especially if it's been unopened or untampered. Um, but unfortunately, uh, typically medical institutions and the DME vendor will not uh, take it back. So again, I often tell patients to go to the Oli Foundation where you can very easily list your supplies that you are donating, where you're located, your phone number, and someone will contact you if they are interested. Um, so another thing that's really important is not only that initial nutrition assessment um, and really being very open with the patient about what to expect, um, but as a dietitian, your role can also be to ease some of the fears associated with tube feeds, right? Initially, when we think of a feeding tube, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, that's, you know, when we think of a feeding tube, it must be someone who's really sick or, you know, there's something going on that they can't eat. Um, when in reality, sometimes it's just there to act as a safety vest or a life vest, right, to support their nutritional needs, to get them through, whether it's treatment, because I work in a cancer institution, um, but in general, the dietitian can really help be a support for the patient and really be a sounding board to listen to them and understand where they're coming from and how it can be quite life-changing. Um, but again, it's also really important to work with the patient, right, and figure out what their needs are, what is their lifestyle like, are they active, if they have a pump, just know some of them are um, portable and there are backpacks, right? So you really wanna make sure you're giving the patient all of the information. After the patient has their feeding tube place, particularly if it's in the ambulatory setting, um, the nurse should be able to show the patient how to flush with a, with a 60 ml syringe. So the patient should know how to flush their feeding tube and have hands-on experience before they're discharged home. Um, however, once the patient is home, typically the case manager who's setting up uh, the ordering of the formula and the supplies, they will also be setting up for a visiting nurse service to come within the first couple days after two placement to do hands-on teaching uh, with the, the patient. Typically, visiting nurse service, if the patient is eligible for two feeding supplies from their insurance, visiting nurse service is also the same. And so the patient will be able to have hands-on teaching, right? Um, but it's very important to make sure as the dietitian, after that tube is placed, within the first 24 to 48 hours after tube placement, you are following up with that patient. Number one, we want to make sure that the patient has received their tube feeding supplies and their equipment and their formula. Many patients are not aware of who their DME vendor is or the durable medical equipment vendor is. We know this because we're in touch with case management, but you want to make sure you're letting your patient know who their DME vendor is. Why? Because it's the patient's responsibility to call seven to 10 days, seven to 10 days before their formula and um, supplies are out to call for a refill. Unfortunately, these vendors do not automatically send out monthly shipments, right? You, the patient needs to call and say, hey, I only have about a week left of formula. Can you send me my refills? So it's important that you let the know, you let the patient know, here's your vendor, here's their contact information, any issues with missing supplies, you're almost out of formula, call the vendor directly. As much as I like to be a patient advocate, I do get a lot of calls from patients saying, oh, it's a Friday at five and I'm out of formula. Ah, you really want to give the patient the power to say, hey, listen, you know, a week before your supplies are out, make sure you're calling the vendor to let them know that you need additional supplies. The other thing that's really important to note um, is that many patients may have their two placed. You gave them great education. They're coming home. They start the feeds and up, oh, 
they're having symptoms of intolerance. Maybe they're feeling really bloated. Maybe they're having loose stools all of a sudden, um, or they're, you know, they're supposed to be doing six cartons a day of formula, but they're only able to do four and they're feeling really full and can't get the full six. It's really important to troubleshoot these issues. Perhaps if they're being bolus fed, they're infusing way too quick, right? We know that too quick an infusion can cause feelings of fullness, nausea, right? So we want to make sure they're doing it at a rate that's going to help them feel well, right? Um, if the patient is doing gravity feeds, same thing. Gravity feeds, you can speed up or slow down the rate of infusion with the roller clamp that's connected to the, the gravity bag. Oftentimes, if patients have the gravity uh, clamp uh, as, as loose as possible, the formula can infuse very, very quickly. And so again, we want to make sure that the patient isn't infusing too quickly, right? Um, if the patient's all of a sudden having diarrhea, well, could it be the formula? Formula, uh, Perhaps, right? But we also know there's so many reasons why a patient may be having diarrhea. Firstly, take a look at their medication list. Many patients, especially a lot of the patients I see, are on magnesium supplements. Oftentimes, magnesium supplements can be a culprit for diarrhea. We also know that when patients are fed through a tube, many of their medications become liquid, right? The liquid form that they can use through the tube. Many of these liquid medications are sorbitol-based, right? Which is a sugar alcohol, and we know can cause pretty bad diarrhea in some patients, especially if they're very sensitive. So it's really taking a look at that. I do find for some patients, you know, eventually they may require fiber supplementation if they are on a uh, fiber-free formula, right? Because we know the bulking action of soluble fiber can be very helpful in these patients. So it's also taking a look at that and working with the patient and letting them know, you know, essentially what, what their options are. And then, you know, kind of going forward, if a patient is having difficulties tolerating their formula for the first few days or they have questions, I usually like to follow up every two to three days. If a patient has a feeding tube and we know they're going to be stable, they're doing well, everything's going great, I usually like to follow up, you know, the first few days after, after their tube is placed, about three months after, six months after, a year after, depending on the tube placement um, and how long they're going to have it. So at least we have consistency and follow up. Of course, the patient always has my information to follow up. But one thing I want to mention, if a patient, if you're following up with a patient and they mention that their tube is causing a lot of pain internally, externally, right? Sometimes it could be just from a little movement, right? The feeding tube is in a stoma, so you can expect the tube's going to move a little bit and some days may cause some irritation. As long as it's not getting progressively worse, it's usually okay and will get better. Not a huge deal. But if the patient is complaining that there's a lot of discharge coming out of the tube, um, one of the big signs of infection may be a very strong, malodorous um, smell coming out of their tube, right? Or again, if there's a lot of abdominal pain or resistance when they're trying to infuse a formula or free water flushes, to direct them to their medical team or the, or the provider who placed the feeding tube. In those cases, it's important that a patient is seen um, because uh, pretty, pretty quickly because it could be sign of an infection or tube dislodgement, in which case... Again, you want to direct them to their medical team. In general, uh, the dietitian has a big role in managing these, these enterally fed patients. I hope you enjoyed the video today, and I look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.